course, my printer wouldn't work right before some So I tried, I wanted, there was a bunch of things I kind of wanted to cover, and then I realized quickly that wasn't going to happen. So I would, I might bring it up other times if people would be interested in, one, how gender relations were formed within uh, capitalism, and how that formed the nuclear economy as well. And then another presentation about um, like resistance and trying to shift gender roles, and when it's within the capitalist system, how oftentimes it just reinforces capitalism and so the need for then like a radical approach um, to doing that without just generally what goes on now just reinforces that system and then also to then do further work um, doing further work to think through our own formations of gender and looking at um, deconstructing our gender while being also attentive to our race and class and sexuality and nationality dynamics. Um, so first off, get my hair out of my face. Um, rather than me speaking as an authority on this subject, which is one the first thing of a feminist practice, is um, I'd rather participate in thinking together. Um, because typically with knowledge production, um, someone has the knowledge, they're the authority, and then I just pass it on to you as passive learners. And um, I'm not an expert, I'm not trying to be. Um, so I will, I'm just gonna tell you, I guess, my experience, which is why I'm up here talking. Um, and so yeah, part of the feminist practice is challenging what an authority is and how knowledge is produced and what it's produced for and how it's passed on. Um, I kind of like some active learning, which means, actually it's written on paper. Um, so things like reading or being on your Facebook or internet, I mean, some people might have really important papers to write over there. Um, and then sometimes we have to think about what is active and passive learning, oftentimes, if people are passively listening, learning or listening, it comes from a place of privilege, of thinking you know better, you know what's right, um, so you don't have to be actively engaged in what's going on. Um, and then just thinking for each individual what is important for you and your learning. Um, and then interrupt me at any time if you want to clarify or to disagree or ask a question. Um, all right, and so my experience and why, first of all, it's important for me to state, I guess, my experience and where I come from is part of a feminist practice, which I will get into a little bit later, um, since this is how I was socialized into gender roles and show up here as a person. Um, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Mormon, um, predominantly on the east side of the city, which is important because that, that Salt Lake is very classed um, and racialized. And uh, I I have four brothers, I'm in the middle, and so one of my very first memories of concept thinking about the self and my place in the world was me um, just one day when I was probably five or six realizing like, well wait, so men are bishops and prophets and they baptize and just thinking how the men do all these important things and then, so trying to figure out my place and all that and what that meant. And then, um, so then, I didn't realize for later, but that internalizing how what that meant, and so that meant one like I can't think. I need a man to think for me, and I can't even get into like heaven, or like you know because that's Mormonism. So I can't even get into heaven without a man. So then um, I guess that's kind of in some ways or in lots of ways shaped who I am and doing this work and my resistances to that in my life and some of those have worked. That's why it's a practice because for me it's as well, continually changing and shifting as I learn. I did my undergraduate graduate at the University of Utah in sociology and anthropology. And I did a good amount of gender classes there. Um, and then I just did my master's in cultural anthropology and social transformation. And I think I was drawn to anthropology because there's a space for difference. So there's difference in gender roles. And, um, and it was actually very relieving for me to find out when I was that age. Um, so, So 
So I guess first is like, who or what is a feminist? Does anyone want to answer? You don't. Have, you can. You don't have to. <laughs> Great. Um, a feminist is a particular historical, uh, and political, ideological, and social movement arising out of particularly uh, Western European thought. Um, arguably starting with Wilson Craft, progressing through various social phases of development. Um, first off, the struggle for political recognition, then the second phase, which was primarily a struggle for uh, economic and social recognition, and then the third phase, which is over the very definition of feminism itself. Um, and so a feminist is one who adheres to the practices and thought arising out of that particular historical trend. Beautiful. That was. I wish that was completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that was fine because I, you know, wanted to see where people are coming from. I guess we should pick Greg. And exactly right. And so, in that movement, did start out in mostly, which is one of the most important things to think today um, with the feminist movement is it was mostly white middle up, not mostly was white middle upper class women at the beginning. Um, so one of the very important books, I think, to read is uh, Angela Davis, Woman, Race, and Class. Um, it's an excellent history, and it talks about how in um, the abolitionists and the social movements, how there was splits and differences based on race and class and gender, and like white women trying to fight for their rights to vote, then how they were first working with like the abolitionists and black men to end slavery, but then they were kind of starting to be like, well, wait, what a minute, what about us? And so then they aligned with white men. And so it's just this ongoing continual history we have in this country of not being able to form alliances across these differences. Um, and again, white, you know, middle upper class women not realizing when they called out for a, a sisterhood and a womanhood, they were not realizing their own, these differences and their close relationship as well as power. Um, so that's one of the main important things to think and as a practice um, and like for me as a white United States middle class woman that in, in some way like a cultural inheritance of mine so it is important especially for me to think through that I'll go through that maybe a little bit later but um, I did find this really nice quote I posted the other day I really like feminism encourages women to leave their husbands kill their children practice witchcraft destroy capitalism and become lesbians <laughs> And um, it's kind of tr it's true, I think, <laughs> because one, to leave your husbands, um, once you start realizing how sexism functions, like for me personally, along my practice, I thought when I was younger that if I had a man who, say, agreed to do childcare and was willing to follow me to California to go to graduate school, that we, didn't, we weren't operating in a sexist framework. Um, Come to find out, that's not true. Um, there is still lots of sexism occurring, and the more I learned about sexism, how it operates, and then trying to speak that in a relationship and how gender collides. Yeah, so part of the reason I got divorced was because of sexism, so I see that too, leaving your husband. Kill your children, I guess, if in case you know you get upset, you realize the double work day. Um, I have lots of friends dealing with that and dealing with husbands that go to work and they work all day and husbands think their job's more important. So I can understand just losing it. Husbands sometimes think the wives are better with the kids. But I advocate for rather like support systems, working for child, affordable child care than killing your children. Uh, practicing witchcraft when you learn that uh, a nature-based egalitarian religion was systematically and violently and deadly destroyed hundreds of years ago. It might make you want to connect to that past that was, that's been lost and totally forgotten. Um, destroy capitalism, because again, once you start to see how sexism operates, you see how other oppressions operate within capitalism and become lesbians. Well, once you start to realize how sexism works and um, how in some ways you've just been trained and molded to have heterosexist desires and be monogamous, then you might look out other forms of desire and pleasure. So. That is what, according to Pat Robertson, is old feminism. I guess I agree. Um, <laughs> and kind of so I guess what I've already been talking about is 
like why this past history, it's important to think, because um, we have to think how, sex, how power and sexism operates in, through this political history and what has formed it, so it's very important to learn that history. Um, so then, like, I'm glad Greg hit up on lots of the main points, that the basic definition of feminine, feminiz, feminism has been a political, cultural, or economic movement aimed at establishing equal rights and legal protection for women. Um, and then it gets equated as equal rights with men, uh, women are human beings. But then the main problem with this is it doesn't shift dominance. It doesn't shift anything. It's just, it doesn't make that problematic. It's just, oh, we're opening the doors and gates. So if you, you can come on in, women, you can have these rights. But it doesn't shake um, what is a man and what is a human being. Because oftentimes what is a human being is because of a Western culture, it's assumed that to be mad. Does that make sense? Okay. No? Great. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to add that it's sort of like, it's sort of like uh, ra uh, colorblind is the new racism. Oh, oh yeah. That's, oh. All right. Well, no, it's similar. It's similar to how racism operates and uh, the, the dominant LGBTQ movement because it becomes like, okay, we'll open this up and have equal rights. Um, but then it is again like it doesn't shift anything at the top. Um, and it's kind of similar, you know, with some ways with class because it's like, oh, if you work hard enough, you can do it. You can have rights and be equal. You just have to work hard. You don't have to be poor and working class. You just have to work harder and then you can have these rights. Um, so again, yeah, it assumes the system's open to all, but what's not seen, discussed, critiqued is. Um, how to have or act in a particular manner to be considered a human being, to have rights, um, similar to kind of what is even going on with Obama right now. And it was interesting, even in the Obama campaign, how oftentimes he had to emphasize that he was Christian, he was just like everyone else, um, that he is American. Um, and so these are kind of the things to look for. Um, and then... And then part of what a human being and a man is assumes that you're rational and assumes rational thought. Um, and this is a longer maybe discussion about that. But um, who historically have been considered rational? It's been uh, white male property owners. Chris, did you have your? Yeah, uh, you mentioned Obama. Um, Bell Hooks was here recently, and one of the things she brought up that was of interest was not only just the way Obama had to keep doing this, but the way um, gender and race actually kept getting played off one, one another in the last election between Hillary and Obama, mm. a white woman versus a black male, et cetera, et cetera, and then start to analyze a woman. Mm -hmm. So just the way gender and race were sort of, or not, yeah, gender and race were played off against each other. Yeah. Um, and, and then also with Hillary, how she has, has to present herself in ways. She has to, like, act very serious. She has to, um, you know, kind of in some, present herself as a man. And then there was, even when, during the election, they got started saying something that she wasn't then emotional enough, so then she all of a sudden started being, I don't know, so it's just this weird, especially a woman, this weird back and forth, because they want you to be soft and feminine, but then you still have to be like rational and act like a man. Um, and so, so historically, who's been considered rational? White male property owners. Women have historically not been seen as rational since they are viewed as being too emotional. Um, so again, for women to have positions of power, you need to be rational, not emotional. Um, and a feminist practice, I believe, is to have space for emotion. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more later. And also, what does it mean for men to embrace their women? What for men to embrace their emotions and women to support this expression? And um, even for a woman, it, I, sometimes I'm not very difficult to even know about for men, just because of how we've been socialized into that, that men don't cry. Um, and again, I saw that a lot in my marriage. Um, so I think I saw that before. Can we learn from the dominant history of feminism? And so I guess at this point, it's like, well, is feminism relevant today? Um, is it important to think and engage, particularly for social movements and for dismantling capital? Well, I think so, obviously. Um, being part of the Women's Committee, women make up 50% or more of the population. And under capitalism, women are especially subject to discrimination and 
being taken advantage of. So, for a movement that has at least tried to define women in a different light, try to break them free of their gender roles, I think that it's still important because those still exist. Mm -hmm. so. okay, Victor. I think it's important because no matter uh, how many rights women can have, you know, capitalism and the government, it's basically an extension of the old patriarchy, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's making an influence for women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is, and here's why I don't think it is. Because feminism is not simply a struggle for equality. Mm -hmm. um, feminism is a concrete movement. It has a concrete origin has concrete modes of practice, which actually, I mean, there are there are strains of feminism, especially uh, like Angela Davis, a lot of um, radical militant feminism, mm -hmm. that actually move away from the traditional dynamic of feminism. And to what extent they are part of feminism is one question. To what extent they're not part of the dominant discussion of feminism is another. But if you look at the actual movement, or not grant equality, win equality, equality is never granted, um, in which women can win genuine equality, by and large they don't share a heritage with the feminist tradition. They share um, the, the, the three main move, movements that I can think of are Marxism, mm -hmm. um, general socialism including anarchism, um, and so someone like Anna Goldman, and then um, certain forms of indigenism especially in Latin America and South Asia, in which there is radical equality. But none of those, some elements of socialism, some elements of Marxism, share in elements of feminism as a practice or as a historical movement. Mm -hmm. But none of those are based on or are core to feminism. And so I think that those three practices, obviously I would advocate for Marxism above others, but Marxism, general socialism, including anarchism, and forms of indigenism, are much more effective in the struggle for women's and gendered equality rather than feminism as a, as a particular movement or historical practice. Chris? Yeah, I'd actually just ask the question, do you see feminism and capitalism as being mutually exclusive, or do you think it's the case that um, they can coexist um, as identity politics, um, whereby it's more about making uh, Rather than making the sexes equal, it's about allowing women to achieve what men can achieve, especially in a capitalist society, be it owning property, be it voting, um, rather than a sort of true egalitarianism. Definitely no, and that's what I was, you know, bringing up before that it doesn't shake what's dominance. It's just trying to then emulate men and gain those rights without shaking what capitalism is. So, um, you know, and I definitely agree with Greg, and I guess, you know, in some ways. I don't know if I would even label myself a feminist, but I think, again, for where I come from and my cultural inheritance as being a white middle class woman in the United States is important to think, and I think you can still engage that along with these other, I think, movements, but I don't agree. And that's what I was going to talk about next is what happens when it becomes an ideology and then, um, and you know, how ideologies then, um, in that history of it operating as an ideology, and then the importance, I guess, within these different movements as well, and within a movement that is dismantling capitalism, to continue to have that strain of thought within there, because if not, then we just reproduce sexism within the movement, or we reproduce sexism when we go have change. Um, when an ideology, when it um, masquerades as a truth, it ignores differences, um, it ignores differences, again, which is what we were talking about, the history of feminism before, how it ignored these things. Um, and that as a practice that was not open to engagement or critique, um, again, assumed affinity between women. Um, so then I guess I would like to propose, since we're critical and should be of this past cultural history, not even sure, so then what I guess would be a feminist practice within the larger movement? Um, how that can be a strand within there. Um, so what is a practice, the dit noun definition of just the actual application or use of an idea um, or method as opposed to theories. Verb is to perform an activity or exercise skill repeatedly or regularly in order to improve or maintain one's proficiency to carry out an action and observe. And so from there, um, 
I just like to think then, what is a feminist practice? First of all, it's a daily practice, it's daily commitment, to showing up, engaging, it's ongoing. Um, and it's not a universalist approach, which again, is why we need to know the history of why it's not. Um, and then to continually think, reflect, and learn, and adjust your practice, and then continue acting. Um, and then a feminist practice is also attentive to how sexism and resistance to sex sexism operates differently based on race and class and sexuality and religion and nationality. Um, and again, the differences in relation to privilege, to dominance. Um, so then it's important to think these differences, and so then to think race and class and sexuality and nationality, to think, I guess, your social position or your subject position, um, and then the multiple different complex ways we inhabit these spaces. Um, it's not just one or the other. You're not always oppressed or always, uh, I mean, I, I, that's not true. But I guess it's shifting and depending on the context. And then, for example, like to work for me as a white woman, it's like I have privilege in some spaces, and then in other spaces I don't, and then sometimes they intermix in certain weird ways, because um, I've been in some situations where, you know, as for me, for my resistance, it's always been like being really loud and talking previous practices, I guess, but um, then I've been in spaces before where that was then, uh, then just seen as like my whiteness to take up too much space. So for me, my resistance to sexism was taking up a lot of space because I hadn't been given that, especially being raised Mormon. Um, but then how then I have to think that as well in certain spaces because then who is present, what's going on there, um, if that makes sense. Um, and so then for, you know, for each person it's different. So that's why it's not just a universal approach. It's not just like step by step because then for each individual it's going to have to be thinking these dynamics and intersections in your life. Yes. Can you explain sort of what you mean by space and maybe give some examples? Yes. How did I use space? I can't think of how I use space. Because um, I have a lot to say about space, but um, how did I just use it? You mean like interactions with others? The specific thing you talked about is um, taking up space, especially by speaking mm -hmm. loudly. Mm -hmm. And you said it was because taking primarily as a woman, because you weren't given that space as a woman under Mormonism, gotcha. but in other alternatives, you gotcha. have too much space. Okay, Chris. And you also mentioned that you have privileges in some spaces where they gotcha. don't have the same privilege in other space. Is that what you're going to say? Oh, well, I was just going to ask if you mean like social standing, is that what you mean by space? I do, and I mean, I guess I mean a few things by that, so I'm glad you brought that up to clarify. Um, one aspect of taking up space is then like how often you're talking, um, if you're allowing other people to speak who in like a group is being heard and um, but then there's also things like if you notice on the train or the bus um, men particularly white men tend to take up a lot of space um, and I even started when as I started to notice this about myself how I am a gendered being I started to notice like how like I'd be sitting on the train and I'd be all in my little chair fine but then like as soon as like a man would come sit by me, like I would shrink and get smaller and smaller. Um, and so then part of then I guess a practice for like a woman would be how in those particular spaces how to use your space. And then for a man would be to be aware of there's someone next to you, you can't be sitting like this and just, you know, that there's other people going out, going, there's other people around you that might want to share this space as well. Um, and then, Oh, and so then, you know, in some situations, so then like in some spaces, I guess, you know, if it's a, say it's a woman only space. Well then in those spaces, I have privilege as a woman because I can identify as a woman. There's people that, which I'll bring this up a little bit later, there's also people, because I don't think gender is binary, um, there's people that aren't a man or a woman. And so where then, because that use of space, I guess, is more, not as physical, but, um, So, so I guess just depending on, I guess I'm using the word space as just different contexts in that use. Do you have any other questions?
questions about space. You can take up space to ask about space. <laughs> I know at this point, but I will if I have more questions. Okay. Um, I guess, yeah, so then think in the multiple complex ways that we have privileges and oppressions um, and how they intersect and shift and then also how we internalize these representations, which for me has been a lot of work that I've done when you decide when you're five years old that you need a man to think for you. It is oftentimes very taxing and um, to then to just continually break through that and to continue to show up to have a master's degree to do these things. Um, and so, you know, for each person, it's going to be in different by what you internalize. And then and it's not the same. It's not that, like, every white middle class Mormon girl has internalized the same things as I did. Um, so, and again, so then I like this quote from George Orwell. He says, To see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle. And I think that's why we need each other and why we need difference in the movement because. Um, I guess, you know, we need allies and sometimes we need people to point out certain things that we're not going to see. Like I'm, well, every day, even though like I'm committed to being, to having like a non, like racist um, practice, for example, there's things I just do every, every day. And then, you know, and I'm learning to catch myself on them and think through those, but then to have people in your life as well. Um, and I guess I'll talk a little bit more about later what that looks like, but like, um, for example, um, I had a, my, one of my friends who is a, a working class white woman, she often points out how she often is not seeing her class struggle in this other movement I was previously in. Um, for example, on Facebook, our friend had written that it's not enough to be trans friendly, that we should undo our own gender. And then someone asked this individual what that looked like. And then this person used middle class examples of what undoing gender would look like, but didn't mark them as such. Things like learning to speak up and having opinions. And for my friend who is a working class, she was like, well, where I come from, my working class background in Wisconsin, women are, it's okay for women to be opinionated and to speak up. So for her, that wasn't a resistance to sexism. And then it kind of just upset her for this person well, I guess there's tension going on between that, yeah, but, um, so then I guess just the importance of marking that and that these resistances aren't going to look, always look the same, but then the importance to have those allies so then for that person to contact this person and then have a conversation about what that was. Um, and then, and, because even on that note, like, dominant feminism did not change. I mean, it still kind of hasn't, but it didn't change until people from different socioeconomic race class had to bring it to the te their attention. It doesn't mean that it is always these, these people that have come from different race or class or genders. It's not always their, their duty to do, a, to do that. Like it's not my responsibility to teach men about sexism. It's exhausting, I, do it, I deal with it every day. So, but to have that relationship with someone who is working on that themselves is different than someone that's just expecting it to be like a, a woman's responsibility. Um, or, you know, like white people to learn about how racism functions rather than just expecting people of color to constantly tell you. Um, um, so to be engaged with this, again, it means to allow for constant reflex reflexivity and to change your practice. Um, and this means, again, paying attention to what has informed one's practice and what has informed your life and your, your, your heritage and your family and the larger social, political, cultural world. Um, and so then what does it mean to examine our own oppressions and privileges and intersections of that? Um, so, And by doing this, by thinking and acknowledging and being reflexive of your, your social position and your inheritance, you take responsibility for what informs, limits your practice and viewpoints, and then you can begin to make changes and shifts to your practice. Um, and like for me, this means a constant, I guess, attentiveness to how I was formed within 
white middle class Mormonism as a woman with a college education who has been, who has been primarily heterosexual, monogamous relationships with United States citizenship, as a physically able-bodied person who has been pre previously diagnosed as having mental illness, informs my experience, my day-to-day, -day, what my practice is going to be. And that, again, is constantly changing as we move through our life and experiences. But to then, to do this, I think you can do this without um, engaging in identity politics. All right, so then, what are some privileges you hold as a man? Great. Um, the ability to speak and have, uh, assuming no race or class difference, mm -hmm. the ability to speak and have that considered actively, listened to actively, by and large. Chris? Uh, living in a patriarchal society where men make a majority of decisions, I usually end up with a lot of benefits from those decisions uh, at the expense of women. But in my own culture, you know, and in my own family, I see the economical benefit. You know, when you are the man, you make all the money and you decide what to do with it. You, know, mm -hmm. you don't even ask your wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's an emotional thing as well, like especially with the Latino culture, just because you can. I feel like it's always uh, a negative thing that you see on women. Like, okay, they're in an argument, for example, like you just expect them as a man in the Latino culture, they're just going to like be emotional about it and so that therefore you win because you're not emotional about it. And I've always hated that. Let's see, I think Jacob and Chris. Yeah, um, one of the things I think is sort of like a, what makes it such a androcentric society is that all considerations are almost always considered basely for men considerations. I mean, and it penetrates even in, in things that are ostensibly objective, like science or medical research and things like that, mm -hmm. but also in literature, you know, even though you have a lot of, even though you have a lot of considerations to be sound gender neutral in writing, you know, if you look at older things especially, and even newer things, it's always he, she, you know, actually, I guess he, right, it's a sort of assumption that it's normal. Kind of like in the sort of relate racial relation, it's like white. You know? mm -hmm. it's, always, it's always black Debbie. It's never white Debbie, right? Mm -hmm. so. uh, I can always be open and aggressive about my sexuality. As to where if women do that, they're considered a slut. There's a double standard there. But we'll try. <laughs> yes. Um, there's an ideological and conceptual monopoly uh, by men on violence, um, which is doubly bad because. Um, one, men are, by and large, it, it's more acceptable for men to be violent um, in various ways, uh, which cuts two ways, which is one, it's more, it's more likely that men, and I reap the benefit that any sort of violent impulse I may have, it's normalized, whereas women are not. Uh, it's not normalized among women, and so it's, if they do anything violent or have any violent impulse, it's bad. But that's also a double-edged sword because it's part of my ideological commitment to get women to be violent. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, so, so it, it functions, one, to enshrine patriarchy mm -hmm. um, and uh, grant men the dominant position to perpetrate violence. Um, and it also builds what I think is a, an essential and an effective wall for patriarchy and capitalism to prevent victims from engaging in especially violent self-defense, mm -hmm. and so. And then, really, quick, and then I would add also. Then I agree with all your points. And then the flip side of that is then, when there's domestic violence situations, with when the woman is more violent, and is there, and then the man does not have a, he doesn't come out and speak to that, or then when he does, he's met with like, you know, oh, your, your, yeah, your lady hit you with that or through something like that. People don't believe him and they make jokes and his masculinity is put into question that he can't keep his woman in line um, and then they don't generally, I mean it's not as frequent but it is. You know, if, if, they, if he does call, he's more likely to go to jail um, even if it was her perpetrating so, Um, Jacob sort of mentioned this with medicine, but as far as medical goes, uh, most, I mean, we have Viagra where women can't have adequate access to um, Etc. 
and are constantly being threatened by, again, a patriarchal society. And then on top of that, um, the other thing I was going to mention was, actually, I think Victor were to say something about the committee panel. Well, I think like in our society, you know, men are valued if you are like smart or successful, you know. Women are valued, she's beautiful. You know? mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, you notice in the last elections, you know, you know, all the news and all the programs, they were talking about Obama, McKay, they were talking about, okay, Obama has this plan, McKay has this plan. When they talk about, like, uh, Hillary and Sarah Palin, you know, they're always talking about, like, what kind of, like, dress is mm -hmm. Hillary uh, wearing, what kind of dress Palin is wearing, what is the size of Hillary's pants, you know? Yeah. They didn't even, like, they didn't even give them, like, like, the benefit, you know, to talk, like, about them, like, a, like a smart yeah. person, you know, because they're a smart woman. Hillary, you know, pain to you. Yeah, Chris? Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, in, in, in that patriarchal society, uh, it seems there's this cultural assumption that uh, taking care of children is a woman's work, mm -hmm. where women are the primary um, persons, and then men are kind of just floating yeah. out of the situation. I have something actually I was going to read about that right now in case you guys have some very good examples in life. In case someone had any, I was prepared because I was raised with boys, so you should all learn from the Boy Scouts. Lost it. I think one of the great examples is Michelle Obama. Um, during the campaign, she took a very um, "I'm a mother first approach, mm -hmm. you know, um, for political growth, like for um, votes. Um, so that was something that uh, Bell Hooks talked about. So then, this one is a, an example of holding privilege as a man that speaks to what Chris just said. If a man chooses not to have children. His masculinity will not be called into question. Um, and I think this is an interesting double standard because as well, like for a woman, it's that mother whore dichotomy. So right now, like I'm, I'm single, I was married, I got divorced, and he just died. And so people apparently now, enough time has passed that people feel comfortable now asking when I'm going to have children. And I think that's odd because one, I'm not seeing anyone, but then if I was to just go get like knocked up or go have casual sex and get pregnant or go, then, you know, then there's that as well. So I just think it's rather rude as well that people would even ask that. And so there's that split. So it's like, okay, so I need to go, then go find a man. My clock's ticking. I'm 31. I got to go find a man and then, you know, get him to have a baby with me. Or if not, then I'm just a slut that gets, um, yes. Um, when talking about like gender roles and kids, so what would be the ideal way to raise like a newborn who stays at home? I mean, that's a whole. That's why I probably won't have children. Um, I don't. It's very complicated, and I think it's just going to go into that. You know, I don't think there's like one necessarily way to do it. But it, I have friends that constant. It's a constant battle to fight gender toys, to fight gender clothing. Um, my friend, her, she lets her daughter wear what she, you know, kind of wear what she wants, and tends to dress more androgynous and is interested in sometimes more boy things and she had someone even ask her the other day why she was raising her child to be a lesbian. And she's two. Two. So I, I don't know and that's probably why I won't have children. So, because <laughs> it's exhausting. I found a solution to that. I read something on uh, something about parenting and they said that just have one child because that way like each parent can have like 50% of the, of the you know time with their child. And that was like one way that they were finding that it was like the best way uh, to not have that issue. And I thought, oh, okay, so. um, I'm going to say something to that, and then uh, Chris, and then. I think there's too many people in the um, world. I was going to, as well, though, with that, you also, <laughs> then it's not just the family, because we're in this whole larger social, cultural, political world. So then you have, like, even my same friend, like, if they go over to their friend's house, then they start talking about princesses and wanting to do princess thing. And then my friend's like, oh, we got to go. She doesn't play princess. So it's like, then you send them off in the world, so and this, you know if you can have them like not watch TV and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's difficult. Chris, uh, if I understood Andrew's question, that was particularly about um, how does one like divvy up the responsibilities of raising a child? Uh, obviously, you can live in a, well, yeah, but I also like that. <laughs> no, not to every else's responses are great. But the, the problem is, yeah, we live in capitals and people have to work for a living. Um, and often, again, there's the cultural assumption that the man goes out and works, or the woman stays home and takes care of the children. Uh, and obviously, uh, 
it doesn't even take a radical social society to figure this out. I mean, Sweden already figured it out. You just give both parents time off of work to raise a child. Rather than just, it's the woman's responsibility or you have to make a decision about who stays home and who goes out and works. It's if you have a really good job that gives you benefits, uh, one of those benefits should be um, paternal leave. Yeah, One really interesting thing that I'm noticing about this whole conversation is also this, like, going back to the gender thing, like, talking about a heterosexual couple is totally patriarchy. Again, like, it's so cyclical that, like, it's like, well, who takes care of the child? Like, the men, and, like, it's assumed that we're all talking about it. Is it the man or is it the woman? And I think that's why, like, excuse me, <clears throat> this discussion is really important. But it is really important that whenever we are saying these things, we're also realizing that like like to me to be honest this is an insensitive conversation yeah, definitely like, it's like you. if i want children um like already my society is telling me i need a husband like my child is gonna have problems suppose a child based on like being raised in a lesbian relationship um, that's obviously not the case and continually again like i think this is a really relevant conversation to have that is, and I'm not saying that anyone is like particularly doing it like on purpose, but like even with our day-to-day -day language, it's extremely important to recognize that like just because I have been um, raised this way, like I do it sometimes where I'm like talking about like a family and I'm like, when I'm talking about a family, I'm talking about heterosexuality and that's dangerous to even me. So to be able to realize that I'm doing this and to focus on it and then to look at that and be like, oh, and that's why this is problematic as well. Yeah. And it does exist. It's so, it's all over the place. Yeah, thank you so much for you know, being able to say that, which again, I think is why it's important to have these discussions in groups because of then sometimes what we then don't see or, and then we, what we habitu habituate with while we don't even want to. Absolutely. Right. With respect to Victor, uh, another alternative is to just have the state raise the children. And not in like some weird platonic way, um, where like nobody knows who their children are. Uh, but what they had in, for example, the Soviet Union, they had it in PRC, they have it in Cuba. Um, you have people who are dedicated to childcare, but you actually pay them well. So it's not like the most abusive like people you can find off the street, which is what we have here. Um, but you actually pay them well. And so during the day where people do have to work, there's paid for free childcare um, with qualified trained people who actually have like degrees in it rather than just like nothing, which is what we have here. And so in that case, it alleviates the question of whether or not it's a man or a woman raising them, whether or not it's a hetero or homosexual or plural or you know, whatever kind of relationship it is, there's a baseline that everyone, the children are, are raised by the state, essentially. Which we kind of have here, but it's really poorly done. Yeah, have yeah. you ever, I've worked on lots of I've seen the world as a more children. The what? The world as a more children. We already have it now, so. Yeah, really nice. No more children, right? Chris. Uh, even outside of the U.S. and you know, families, uh, you have particle paternity like they have in some South American cultures. They have what? Uh, particle paternity. The idea is this. Uh, you have a bunch of uh, people in a tribe or whatever, and they intermingle and have sex with whoever. But if a woman gets pregnant, any guy that has had sex with that woman is not responsible for the child. So it's not just solely one man taking the child. It's, if you have sex with a woman, you're now part and parcel responsible for the child. I mean, skimming gifts, taking the energy chain to hide, etc. Yeah, it's actually kind of a weird rationale. <laughs> and then, and then also something that again helped me by having these sorts of conversations with people that come from different backgrounds and experiences. Because I, thinking for that, I was my experience being oppressed as a woman. Then I didn't realize the privileges I have as a woman, um, which I definitely do have privileges. Um, um, my ability to have and 
to be able to have definable markers of what my gender is. As a result, strangers don't assume. They can ask me what my genitals look like, and they don't ask me how I have sex, which I know. I have one friend that is almost asked every day these types of questions by strangers. Um, then I can, there's a public bathroom I can use. I don't have to wonder about safety. I, there's a space, again, there's a space for me there's, that I can go and use. I don't have to worry about safety and choosing a locker room and choosing a bathroom. Um, if I end up in the emergency room, I don't have to worry that my gender will keep me from receiving appropriate treatment, nor will any of my medical issues be seen as a product of my gender. Um, goes to show that like the sorts of people I guess I surround myself with. But I was at a, at a gay bar and like the, um, this girl, I didn't really know her, but afterwards she was like all upset and I was like, what's wrong? She's like, I'm re I feel really uncomfortable because I'm not sure if those were actually women in the women's restroom. I'm like, why do you, like, it's interesting to me that people really though are so ingrained with this that like she felt Part of herself, she literally felt like uncomfortable, like not knowing, even though it really had nothing to do with her, but it still was a big deal to her. And like, I really had that experience. I'm like, I use men's restrooms if I have to, though it's illegal. It's illegal? <laughs> it is. It is. It's the establishment. You can like, no. yeah, it's oh, yeah. for going into the wrong restroom. I, I read about that this, this weekend. Uh, somebody transgender. Transsexual, free up transsexual in Las Vegas was uh, was banned for life from a from a hotel, the Cosmopolitan in Las Vegas for using uh, the women's bathroom at f at three four a.m. on Monday morning. And there was absolutely nobody, <laughs> and, and yet yeah, they targeted her outfits for being transsexual, uh, but they. Uh, yeah, they targeted and discriminated. It was, according to them, trespassing. Yeah. Uh, so if she tries to go back, she'd be trespassing uh, on the properties. So they banned her for using the women's bank. Uh, Kristen has Jacob. So whether or not this is a privilege, I think it's arguable. But kind of how uh, everyone when they were talking about men's privilege, how they were saying that they can speak and be heard. I feel like women, and like I said, I don't really see this as a privilege, but for me as a woman growing up, I was allowed to not live up to my potential, to not take on responsibility, to play the weak role, to take it easy. And some people would consider that a privilege, but I don't. Yeah. No, it's a, de it's a detriment when you try to you see. Then as you get older, like how ingrained that is to then like constantly work and fight against them. Yeah. I think another interesting privilege that like I've noticed in my life sometimes, when it's not, it's just something that happens, right? Like if I'm at a bar and if I'm wearing the right clothes, I will not pay for a drink. Whereas like if a man, no matter how handsome the man is in a bar, not only because I'm gay, but like it's one of the last things on my mind is like, I'm gonna go over there and be like, you're really attractive, let me buy you a drink. <laughs> but like as a woman, that is something that like in certain situations, I benefit just like, just for whatever reason, and I do, and like, it's not necessarily something I can change, like, no thanks, but that and is- you're a bitch. You're right, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, um, this might be a position of ignorance on my on my part, but what what were you speaking to specifically when you were saying that uh, when women are admitted to hospital, there's a question of their you know genital um, configuration well, or whatever? So I guess there there's been in, lots of instances. One just happened recently. I can't remember where where a person that was transgender had a medical emergency, and the paramedics arrived, and instead of helping them, they took pictures and made fun of them. By the time they got to the hospital, they died. So, oh, I see. And then also, and then there's also as well because where did it go? And also things as in and not seeing. Oh, wait, where did it go? Um, and I also said 
nor will all of my medical issues be seen as a product of my gender. Often people that are transgender, then um, it's then seen people that are very, in some ways, ignorant about the differences and then assume that when everyone's had like surgery or that they've done different things to their body, um, so then if there is a complication or something happens, then it's just assumed it's because of their gender confusion. Does that make sense? Um, like, um, like you did it to yourself. This is your, your fault, your problem for being gender confused and for maybe wanting to have a surgery. Um, and then if there's complications around that, or even if it's not related to that, oftentimes it's just still seen as because of that. And Chris and Emily. Although I don't think that women necessarily hold that privilege because I think that a lot of times you can go to a doctor and uh, living in a patriarchal society, they can look at you and you can have this illness and they can say, oh, that's because you're a woman, because you're weak. So. Uh, yeah, well that's true, and I actually had one of my friends recently who's been having some major health concerns, the doctors can't find it, anything that's wrong, so then she's just crazy. Right. Okay. I think a good example of like, this is more to gender, not necessarily, um, just like gender in general. Um, like in prisons, a lot of, if there are transgender people in prisons, a lot of times they don't get the like, Recovery care, maybe that they that they really like, they need. I mean, it can certain infections like post-op things. It takes a lot of healing, a lot of time, and a lot of medical attention. And so I think that's definitely a good example where people, uh, yeah, people aren't assuming like, oh, this person needs this sort of medical attention. Um, not only needs it, but like deserves it. Like it shouldn't be a question. Mm -hmm. um, but especially in prisons, a lot of people deal with these sorts of issues where they don't get um, maybe the hormones that they really do need. Um, it, it can be like really life threatening. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely just based on the whole idea of like, well, you're a man or you're a woman, and so that means you have this or you have this. Like, but it's so much bigger than that. So I think that's a good example to show at least with medical care. Well, and also with the prison system then uh, not being able to choose, there's like, that some people that may still have masculine parts but don't identify as a man or then have to go to the male side of the prison, vice versa. So um, it's almost 10. I have, I mean, if you guys want later, I mean, I have more things that we can continue this conversation. If this guys facilitate it for you guys, we can do it some more. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to bring up that was kind of brought up the, um, about engagement and staying present. So say, for example, like Emily, what she brought up, like, hey, you guys are ignoring this aspect of that. So the importance to like sit and listen to that. And then oftentimes I might write a book about white women's tears. But because um, in some ways that's how we get power. And like what that person was talking about earlier, how um, that's one avenue we can get attention or power is through crime, but then say like if someone's being called out and being racist, lots of times a person then gets upset and leaves or gets upset and then makes it all about them and can't stay present. So the important thing I think is to sit with these difficult conversations to realize, you know, like as it is a practice because I myself have been aware that, that families look multiple different ways, but again, just that continuation that I was talking about that often gets ignored. So. I just add that, I guess, to the end. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yes. So your one, like this um, principles or what the practice of feminism. Um, do you feel like then that it needs to? I mean, obviously, I guess it needs to expand. And when you also expand your like class and mm -hmm. um, ethnicity and all of these things, do you also feel that like inherently in this idea? whether or not it's like historical feminism, that it also needs to spread toward, I mean, gender in general, rather than just like feminism. Like, do you think that those are like the same things? No, definitely not. And I think, and I think that's a problem with even calling it a feminist practice, because even what I do, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily, because uh, I think it intersects with all those different things. And then, and then I guess even goes back to those problems of having that, because it does become an ideology, and this is, Differences that are important in race and class. And so 
sexuality and, and nationality and religion. So with that, yeah. uh, Chris. Um, so would you maybe uh, just sort of sum up? I'm actually going to pose this question. Do you, do you see feminism then as more of less about sort of equality between the sexes and like a, um, so obviously there should be egalitarianism proper. But as feminism should be more about uh, a feminine perspective, uh, feminine subjectivity per se, um, and assuming that be it uh, male or female uh, consideration of situations. Yes, except I don't. I guess I don't believe that there is a like an authentic feminine perspective. Um, yeah. So, but um, I think that there's lessons and things to be learned from that practice that can be included as we work towards like taking dismantling. So I still think there's relevance and how it can be thought and added just for practice I to think. Because I don't think you can just think gender with it. Were you going to say something else? Uh, I guess I was just going to clarify. Outside of like, the dominant patriarchal masculine, like, more of the event, sort of most of this event. If what? Male or female. Like, I'm not saying it's exclusive to the gender. I'm just saying, like, rather than being like a domineering, like, male you know, prototype. Like having, do you mean then like, um, I guess like as we were talking about before, like that having space for emotion? Yeah. I don't understand your question. Well, I guess, well the question was again, like taking out, what is feminism that you saw? Mm -hmm. I would say, well, because I didn't get to all of my things, but I would say, like I was saying before, like the engagement, and then I guess also it was kind of brought up last week too, like critique. I don't think that, I think you should do more than just critique. I think critique's important, but say for like me, when my whole life I'm constantly critiqued by men, to then like have a position, rather than it just being critiqued, sometimes then, like you were saying last week, like when women get defensive or get emotional, it's tied to these other things. So then it, what engagement I think is rather with the critique and the, an engagement and a commitment to showing up with these people in your life um, and working together and struggling through those things. So I think that is the difference that in some ways is what I'm trying to say. It can be a feminist practice. Um, what else was I gonna say? That, like I was talking about before, being reflective, thinking through the continuation. Yes. Do you think that being feminist requires you to be anti-capitalist and like anti-theist? Yes. Or, you're, or we're just going to keep, re, 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 we're, we're not going to learn a goddamn thing from these other feminists and we're not going to change anything, then like we're just wasting our time. There's, you know, let's just go to a movie instead. Right? Mm -hmm. So. What, what other sorts of things, sorry, like would you add onto that list, like anti capitalism, anti theist? Um, well, you know, I think it goes all within that, the larger thing of the anti capitalism. I then think it is a thing of being like, um, shaking what is the dominance, what we think is human, what we think is man. Um, what just, forth, and in, what's up? Sorry, I, just, I can see some issue there with like, for example, with Mormon women who want, who know there's something wrong with the structure, but they don't want to let go of their religion. And so if you say like, right, that's kind of dumb, right? But, but that's just like their personal choice. Mm -hmm. Like they really do believe in their religion. Yeah. So to tell them that you have to be anti-theist. Definitely. You know, would, would not really be in favor of. No, no, and that, that's a really good point. I agree. And I would say, and you know, there it's interesting to see what some Mormon feminists are, are doing and what where they're pushing up against things. And then I think in some ways that's important because through a lot, of, uh, even for Mormonism how it is now. In some ways, for me, it's been nice to go back to think what has been lost through assimil assimilation because previously Mormon women could have the priesthood. Um, and so for me, learning about those types of things, so it's in some ways, because Mormonism itself has been something that has gone through a loss and forgetting for assimilation. So then they've forgotten about their multiple, their different, uh, you know, um, family formations because they weren't all heterosexual. They forgot about that. They forgot about the communist past. Uh, their socialist past, they've forgotten about, you know, this relationship with women. And it used to be women that did have a relationship with the mother god. So for me, you know, I'm, I guess I, that is what I've gone for as, I'm not really practicing Mormon, but that's what's helped me 
as well. Um, but there is that, it's a very tight space um, for lots of these women to live in. And there's some women that have written incredible things about that difficulty and about how, what then their practice looks like, because then it's going to look different than from what my practice looks like. Yes. I mean, I guess to that, um, I really, I really feel that like part of maybe like, I don't consider myself necessarily a feminist, also because I'm not really well read on like these sorts of theories and things. Um, but what I am is a militant atheist, and what I would say to anyone that says like, oh boo hoo me, like I'm in this system, like then work towards something. And if your system doesn't allow you to do that, like because I'm anti-capitalist, the things I see that aren't working in the system, that's why I refuse to work within that system, because it's not going anywhere. And I would say to any woman that says to me, like, I'm a feminist, but I really do believe in this church, then I'm like, well, then maybe you should reconsider your perspective, because if you care enough, you will do something. If you don't care enough, then you will just, like, be in the system. So, like, if you believe that God is so dominant, and it's this male character, then you're never going to be equal, ever. And then maybe you're not a feminist, which is fine. Yeah, well, that's a very good point. It's interesting to see, I guess, what these different women do to re reconcile that, maybe in some ways with themselves. Um, yes. Well, I mean, in the defense of, of some theist feminists, um, what they do is they do work actually within the system as far as it will take them. Uh, which, if you just look at the late 80s, early 90s, uh, often meant excommunication. I mean, there's more than just being like, oh, I'm going to leave the church. I mean, there's a probably, well, actually, they're, not, they're less harsh now. But yeah, I mean, by and large, there's probably a, a point where if you're a radical feminist, you're probably going to leave the Mormon church doesn't necessarily mean you leave the Anglican church or certain you know, Protestant churches or a, uh, pagan churches or whatever. But I mean, there is a, a long distance that you can go in the Mormon church as a radical uh, militant feminist that sometimes they accommodate you just to avoid conflict and then other times your push for equality gets you excommunicated. So I mean, you can still believe it and then you just you, you get excommunicated. I'm just saying it's more than a binary solution. Oh, I agree, but again, like, I'm just saying my personal reaction to anyone with that sort of perspective on like, then get out of the system. If it's that powerful to you. That means, like, leaving their family, though. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. saying. That's like, the hard part. I mean, isn't that, that's a, that's a hard part about life, right? Like, yeah. I mean, no matter what, like, if I'm, di anyone who's different in any way experiences in some way some push and pull, from like loved ones. So that's in the case like you believe to a like a religion who worship like like a male god, like like a father god. What about like any other religion like Hinduism, like like when they worship the goddess and I mean I I'm comfortable with people believing what they want, but mm -hmm. if they like engage with me and want to talk to me about it, then I would just say that. But that's like this is just my personal opinion. This is but I will tell people if they ask me. Yes. So for me, um, I am you know, a pronounced atheist or anti-theist as well. And I try, I've been ultra left in the past and I know that it's been really off-putting. And it's my belief that feminism is a stepping stone. It's not a cure. Like I. Yeah, like that, by no stuff. means say that. It's not a cure. And so I, I see that there are conflicting ideas with Mormonism and feminism, but to see yourself suffer, I feel like when you see other stuff suffer, you can relate. So with feminism, hopefully, and I mean, this might be a misled idea, hopefully they'll eventually move on to something um, more powerful if that makes sense. So I don't, I don't necessarily want, I know people who are 
Mormons and they consider themselves feminists. It's really hard. I have a struggle being around them and holding my tongue. But at least with some people, I know they'll come to they'll finally come to the realization and see that those ideas are conflicting by themselves. But by me being really negative, and obviously this is it's off putting to them. They say, well, you know, and then they'll take everything else you are if you consider yourself a feminism and see that that as well. But that's just my personal. I don't mean to be sour grape, but I have two minutes left on the I camera, so me. so we can still discuss things, but if we want to do like the applause thing, that's cool. Or we'll just let the camera drain out, that's fine too. We'll re-record the applause. Just yeah. Stay there, we can apply it later. Okay, that's, that's really why I'm here. Applause. <laughs> so. I don't know, and if you guys want, because I mean, I have more stuff, I have more things that we can think through later on, so we can always, as I said before, pardon me, what a practice is, is it's ongoing, so. I actually wouldn't mind, like, maybe a month or so from now, like, if you do this again, mm -hmm. or maybe, like, a second half, or just a continuation. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I like it. Well, thank you, well, and then, and then, you know, and I've been, I guess, my schooling, because we did a lot of things, things then also around issues of race in class. You know, they all intersect, but then it's important to, you know, to see how they intersect as well, but then to then also look at it and then historically look at them, which is why I think it would be important as well to talk about how gender formed within capitalism. So, and I don't know your name. Chase. Chase? Yeah. So in the church, what do they... The church? The Mormon church? Mormon church, okay. sorry. What do they, what do they tell the women that, that their role is besides raising kids? I think that's so the, I think they, 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 I don't know, you tell me if it's wrong, I think, What's that? you tell me if it's wrong, I think for the male, the men in the church, they can have a priesthood, right? Mm -hmm. And the woman, they can They're be mothers, They're supposed to nurture like the family, to have a family, and to have kids, and to take care of the household. You're, you're special you're the because you're not babies. And that's yeah. sucks. So you're separate, <laughs> you're separate but equal. Separate. And I mean that in the majority. And you're there to like support your husband <laughs> through his church calling. You get church calling, say like teaching, like, or like playing the piano. Um, yeah. Playing the piano. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like your responsibility to like teach raise children and to like have them like be strong in the faith. Develop like, their, their Book of Mormon story is about like right those stripling warriors who were raised mm -hmm. by single mothers to fight for God, to be in like God's army. And like the mothers, like the, the warriors of course win the battle, but the women are the ones who taught the warriors to like, do it. So yeah, and then like my experience, since I was the only girl, my mother, she sews, she makes everything from scratch. She was super excited when I was born and it just didn't. <laughs> Yeah. They didn't get Melinda, they got Oh, where are we at? So. Now, 